This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Order is restored in Gabon after early Monday attempted coup is thwarted. Citizens of DR Congo urge to be patient as the electoral body finalizes tallying of presidential election results. And Muslims and Coptic Christians in Egypt celebrate Christmas in a symbolic show of religious tolerance. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details of those stories in just a moment. But first, Ramanyan with today's business headlines. Rama. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up a little later in the hour. The rand is showing signs of recovery against the American dollar. We'll look at the numbers. And Nusi's tourism revenues are up by 45% year on year in 2018. We'll be looking forward to the traffic and revenue numbers for 2019 in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we start the broadcast in Gabon, where the chief military rebel who led a failed coup in Gabon on Monday has been arrested and two of his commandos killed after they stormed a public radio station. This is according to the country's presidency. The soldiers burst into a state radio offices at dawn and called on the public to rise up against the rule of President Ali Bongo Ondimba, who is recovering in Morocco after suffering a stroke. Shots were heard around the state broadcasting headquarters in the capital, Libreville, at about the same time as the message was read at 6.30 a.m. local time. Security forces have been deployed in the capital and will remain there over the coming days to maintain order. The elite Republican Guard was deployed around the building and armored vehicles blocked access to the area. 59-year-old Bongo has not been back to Gabon since he went for treatment in Saudi Arabia on October the 24th. In his absence, the Constitutional Court transferred part of the powers of the president to the prime minister. Well, Gabon is one of the few stable economies, not just on the west coast of Africa, but also on the continent. Let's have a quick look at the country's profile. Since independence in 1960, Gabon has had only three presidents. The current president, Ali Bongo Ondimba, took over from his late father, Omar Bongo, in 2009. Omar Bongo ruled this country for 42 years and died in office. Before him was the founding president, Leon Mba, who also died in office in 1967. It is rich with oil deposits, which form its solid economic base. But according to the World Bank, half of the country's population lives in poverty. Before the current events, Gabon has enjoyed relative peace. However, the August 2016 contested elections was one of its restive moments. Over 50 people are believed to have been killed after former Africa Union Chair Jinping contested election results. But the recent hospitalization of President Ali Bongo seems to have been a major concern. Ali suffered a stroke late last year and was first admitted in a hospital in Saudi Arabia before being transferred to Rabat in Morocco. His health status has generated harsh debates in the country, with some raising doubts over his ability to lead. Doubts that are no longer a secret, going by the political situation that is unfolding in Gabon, one which has drawn in the military. Wilkisanyabwa, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, let's hear more about the reaction to this uh, situation. Uh, we can now cross over to New York. CGTN's Nick Harper is joining me from there. Nick, this is quite a rarity on the continent in terms of coup attempts. Has there been any reaction from the United Nations in regards to that coup attempt in Gabon? And if not, what is the likely response? Well, Beatrice, surprisingly, there's been no official response yet from the United Nations headquarters here in New York. However, the daily briefing of journalists at the headquarters is just getting underway. So it's likely to be one of the main topics that is discussed. Now, we could see potentially either a statement being read out by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres' spokesman. If that doesn't happen, that spokesman will undoubtedly be peppered with questions from the assembled journalists to try and find out exactly what the United Nations thinks 
about this. We know from past experience when there have been coups around the world, although they are rare on the African continent, the United Nations is always swift to condemn them, but also to express concern that the international rule of law has been disrupted. They'll be looking to make sure that there is a safe and calm environment in Gabon at this time, and they'll be calling for the leaders to maintain that. They'll also likely to be looking for some sort of reassurances that international law and international human rights are being upheld. So, for example, the commander that's been arrested, they'll want to ensure that he is being fairly treated, uh, even while the government carries out whatever investigations it may decide to carry out. And lastly, we may potentially see the UN Security Council call for some sort of action. At this stage, uh, there's been no calls for an emergency meeting of the Security Council. Gabon is not a country that they normally hold meetings on, uh, so it would have to be a special emergency session. That hasn't been called for yet, but it could be something that happens. And even if there isn't a specific meeting on it, we may still see the 15 member council issue some sort of statement along the same sort of lines as the Secretary General statement, which will undoubtedly also express concern and condemnation at this attempted coup. Well, let's drop in Coletta Wanjohi. She is in Addis Ababa at the seat of the African Union. Coletta, the African Union has condemned that attempted coup in Gabon. What more can you tell us, though, about the reaction from the African Union and any reaction from the African continent? Well, Beatrice, uh, it's true the African Union has condemned and strongly at that because the chairperson of the African Union, Musa Faki Muhammad, has said that he's reiterating his condemnation on the situation in Gabon. Remember, in November, a constitutional change was done, a uh, change in the constitution was done, which the African Union said was not constitutional and urged the Gabon government to stick by the constitution in terms of changing power. And by that, the African Union means that the Gabon people should wait until it is time to elect and go to the polls in order to elect a new leader. Now, the, the African Union says it will remain seized on the matter and it will remain watching closely as it, uh, at, as it sti tries to look for I mean, scenarios of which it could uh, uh, intervene in case the situation in Gabon becomes uh, unpalatable. Well, Nick Harper in New York, though, of course, we did mention earlier that this is quite a rarity on the African continent. And perhaps that is why we haven't heard much from the international community. But what can the international community do, though, to help lawfully elected governments remain in power? Well, from a United Nations point of view, there's always that mechanism of support. The UN is always standing ready to help any country that needs it, especially in times when there is this political uncertainty and instability, when there are attempted coups. Now, there are the additional measures of being able to institute peacekeeping missions, the United Nations sending peacekeepers to a country. Now, Gabon is not one of the countries on the African continent where there are UN peacekeepers. The UN does have an office there. It works in the country but not on peacekeeping matters. There is also the case of setting an example. The international community wants to make sure that when there are attempted coups, that they are dealt with from an international community point of view with swift condemnation. They don't want to see themselves in a situation where we have a dangerous precedence that these sort of coups or attempted coups take place and yet there is no response, no outrage from the international community. So there's always uh, the UN response uh, looking to strongly condemn and also uphold that rule of law around the world. But it is having to tread carefully. The United Nations knows that this is a matter of sovereignty for the people of Gabon themselves. So they need to be there to support, they need to condemn, but at the same time, they are always looking to perhaps be slightly on the back foot, not take the forward offensive. They look to Gabon as governments and leaders to be able to deal with the situation internally while they themselves stand by to offer to support and also to make sure that that rule of law is always upheld. Beatrice. Right, uh, Nick Harper for us there in New York and Coletta Wanjohi at the African Union in Addis Ababa. Well, let's now go to the Democratic Republic of Congo where residents are tensely awaiting results of the presidential elections. The country's electoral commission says it will delay the publication of the results until it has consolidated all the votes it is receiving from polling stations. The commission says it had only received 50% of vote tally sheets by Sunday, which was the deadline. It is not yet clear when the results will be ready. The delay is the latest setback in a poll to pick a successor to President Joseph Kabila. President Kabila has ruled the country since his father's assassination in 2001.
Seni must show it is capable of doing what it committed itself to in front of the Congolese population. We, the Congolese in general, are hungry for these results. We can't keep having postponements like they did in Beni. We have voted and we need the president we voted for. A fact-finding committee has arrived in Somalia to look into allegations of violence and civilian deaths during last month's regional elections. Local residents have welcomed the government's move. It comes days after Mogadishu expelled a top UN diplomat for raising the same issue. For Mogadishu, CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo has more. The newly elected Southwest Regional Leader appointed the seven-member committee in a statement. Abdulaziz Laftagaren says that the committee will investigate events that unfolded in Baidoa in the run-up to the elections that claimed the lives of 15 people. Three days of violence rocked by Doha following the arrest of Mukhtar Robo Abu Mansour, a former Al-Shabaab deputy commander who was later blocked from contesting in regional polls. Weeks later, opinion remains divided regarding his arrest, but locals have welcomed an investigation into the deaths and the arrests of hundreds of demonstrators. We commend our president and support him. Violence and deaths were as a result of the elections. What we want now is justice and good leadership. We want justice for those killed in Baidoa. The formation of the committee is a positive step and we wish them success. Experts say the government's decision to investigate the deaths of civilians will go a long way in ensuring perpetrators of violence face the law. Among those killed included a regional lawmaker. The seven-member committee will have to come up with findings and analyze the events that took place in Baidoa and the arrest of Mukhtar Rabu Abba Mansur before the elections. We hope the committee will provide its findings and this issue will be solved once and for all. Earlier this week, Mogadishu expelled Nicholas Haysom, the United Nations top diplomat to Somalia, after he raised concerns about the killings of protesters allied with ex-militant Islamist Mukhtar Robo. The UN chief Antonio Guterres is now expected to appoint a new representative in due course. No time frame has been given, but the seven-member committee is expected to provide answers to critical questions previously raised by the United Nations and other rights organizations. For now, the former Al-Shabaab number two is still in government's custody, and his fate remains unknown. Abdul Aziz Bilon, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Muslims and Coptic Christians in Egypt celebrate Christmas in a symbolic show of religious tolerance. And South Sudan's President Salva Kiir appeals for a peaceful resolution of the crisis in Sudan. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who we'll come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. My home country lies at the foot of Africa, the southernmost tip of our beautiful continent and the unique point at which two great oceans meet. Now on a clear day in Cape Town, you can just make out Robben Island, the place where Nelson Mandela was jailed for so long. South Africa has changed so much in the years since then, but it is this country's history that shaped me and took me into reporting. I'm inspired by Africa's men and women of courage. It's the everyday hero who brings out my passion. The creatives, the decision makers, the risk takers who are shaping a bright African future. I see them in Cape Town. I see them in the pulsating city of Johannesburg. I see them across the continent and I know our time has come. CGTN is a platform where African voices can speak for themselves. 
and take their stories to the world. My name is Lindy Mtongana and I'm a news anchor and reporter for CGTN. Orthodox Christians around the world have been celebrating Christmas this Monday. The spiritual leader of the Oriental Orthodox Church, Pope Tawadros II of Alexandria, led the Christmas Mass in Egypt, where the majority of Christians are from the Coptic Orthodox Church. CGTN's Yasa Hakim tells us more. This year's Christmas celebration has been unique in several ways. It witnessed the inauguration of the largest Orthodox cathedral in the Middle East. The birth of Jesus Christ Cathedral is built on an area of 15 hectares and can host 9,000 worshippers. It was constructed in two years and funded by donations from Egyptians. This is a great day because we opened the largest cathedral in the Middle East and it shows our gratitude as a community to the Copts. We had the largest cathedral before in Abbasaya in Cairo. Now, this cathedral in the administrative capital is even bigger and is built next to the largest mosque in Egypt, a sign of unity between the Egyptians. From the beginning of the day, we are in a festive mood in every house, in the streets, with the people, everywhere. It's a feeling of love between us all. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Sisi attended the Christmas Mass. In his short speech, he emphasized the need for unity against extremism and terrorism. When we protected our nation from terrorism, we did not just fix the damaged areas, but we managed to build new ones as well. We are building 14 new cities with new churches and mosques and everything else. So, we should learn, as the Holy Pope has said, we must be united, we must be aware, we must be protective and take good care of our country. I repeat, we must take good care of our country. Don't forget ever to protect your country. When we take care of it, we will achieve the impossible. Orthodox Christmas comes a day after a bomb killed one police officer at a church in Cairo. <laughs> As we celebrate today, we must remember the martyrs who sacrificed their lives for us and for Egypt. We remember and pray for the families, especially Officer Mustafa Ibid, who was martyred in the line of duty. We pray for his family and his loved ones, and we pray for the injured as well. May God bless Egypt. For the first time, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, the highest scholar in Islam, gave a speech inside the cathedral. It was a message of solidarity. Islamic law guarantees the safety of all Christian churches and Jewish temples. This is according to Islamic Sharia law. The Islamic law orders Muslims to protect mosques and at the same time orders Muslims to protect churches. This is not just my words, but it's clearly laid down in the Holy Quran. Unlike the Catholics and Western Christians who celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December, the Eastern calendar applied by the Orthodox Copts marks the birth of Jesus Christ on January 7th. They break their 43-day fasting and hold the annual Christmas Mass on the eve of the 7th of January. It was not only a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. The event highlights the harmony between Muslims and Christians through tough times in Egypt. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. It is Christmas in Ethiopia as well. The country which follows the Julian calendar marks the birth of Christ on the 7th of January after 43 days of fasting. During Christmas, horse riding competitions are held around the country to entertain the public for free. CGTN's Coletta Wanjohi reports from Addis Ababa. At the Jarmeda Stadium in Addis Ababa, local horse owners prepare to showcase their prowess to the public. It is the Christmas traditional horse riding contest. The horse riders are from the sub-cities of Addis Ababa. The winner of this tournament gets to represent the city in the regional competitions that will be held in the course of the year. Riders are not allowed to race with their own horses. Instead, they swap and ride each other's. 
When we come here, we are very happy. We always do good training for our horses before. We, the horse riders, also ensure we practice well. Following ancient rules, two jockeys race each other and both are given sticks. Whoever touches the other on the back with a stick at the finish line qualifies to the next round. In the next round, only one is given a stick. If a stick bearer overtakes his competitor, he gets points. This is repeated until the fastest rider is determined. I love this game, which we call Gena. I used to play even when I was in the countryside. And while in the city, I'm happy to be part of the competition. We play for unity and love and also to entertain people. But mostly our target is to enforce unity. The races are not without incident, but overall the event helps revelers get into the Christmas spirit. We Ethiopians love Christmas festivities because we celebrate with such traditional sports including football, and even our clothing projects the festivities. I wish all Ethiopians Happy Christmas. These days, not many people attend these Christmas games, but the crowd was bigger in the past and more colourful. We hope for a bigger crowd next year. Other games like polo are also played during this festive season, with local clubs and embassies in Ethiopia participating. And those who do not take the award this year will prepare for another festive season when they hope to be at their best. Colette Onjohi, CGTN, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir is urging Sudanese people to use peaceful means to resolve a recent conflict. The protests grew out of concerns about economic hardship in Sudan, and President Kiir has sent a delegation to Khartoum to explore ways for South Sudan to assist. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports from South Sudan's capital, Juba. Juba says it's ready to mediate between the demonstrators and government in the Sudan. South Sudan's government says dialogue is the most viable option for resolving the disagreement in Khartoum. South Sudan's peace deal is already signed. We are in the process of implementation of the agreement. It doesn't stop us from finding peace for other sisterly countries. We are ready to help Sudan because we want to have peace in the entire East Africa or Igad region. Juba is also struggling to tackle its own economic challenges. The country depends on oil for financing more than 98% of its budget, but production in some oil fields remain halted due to the war. Revenue from oil has reduced, inflation is high, with prices of basic goods rising beyond the reach of many. However, President Kiir's government says it will work closely with Sudan so that the oil money benefits both countries. If we have resources and we are blessed by God Almighty to have resources as Sudan and South Sudan, why don't we work together so that we can use them together for the benefit of our people? South Sudan's oil passes through Port Sudan, then to the international market. Juba pays Khartoum transit fees. Relations between South Sudan and Sudan have been improving since Khartoum brokered a peace deal signed in 2018. Many of Juba's opposition groups reside in Khartoum, and some experts say political instability in Sudan could derail implementation of the South Sudan's peace deal. There are concerns a political crisis in Sudan may see Khartoum lose the leverage it has with South Sudan's groups opposed to the current peace deal. Patrick Poyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. Meanwhile, Israel-bound planes are not allowed to fly over Sudan. Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir issued the order over the weekend in a rebuttal to recent claims by Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. CGTN Stephanie Fried in Tel Aviv has the latest. Sudan and Israel don't have formal ties, but that didn't stop Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from indicating that outbound or incoming flights from or to Israel can cross over into Sudanese airspace. Over the weekend, Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir denied that claim. Israel and Sudan have historically been at odds, but when Khartoum cut ties with Iran in 2017, Israel's government warmed to the idea of improved relations. During 
Chadian leader Idris Deby's unprecedented visit to Israel in November, word of secret Israel foreign ministry meetings with Sudanese counterparts surfaced and speculation followed that Sudan and Israel will normalize relations in the near future. I think is, uh, uh, is a testament of what is going to happen with other such countries in Africa as well. And I believe that you are paving the way for many others. Long-standing reports of Israel government weapons sales to the Sudanese government were bolstered in December when a retired Israeli major general was hit with U.S. sanctions for reportedly supplying weapons to Sudan's government and the opposition. Despite his public denial of Israel's access to Sudanese airspace, President al-Bashir said he is being advised to normalize relations with Israel in order to stabilize unrest at home. Stephanie Freed, CGTN, Tel Aviv. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in Cairo for a four-day state visit. He met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and other officials, continuing cooperation on the Palestinian crisis. However, in a press interview, Mahmoud Abbas has shown a major concern, saying that he does not believe a solution for his people would be achieved soon, especially after the failure of reconciliation efforts with Hamas. Here's Adel Makhroui with more. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas arrives to Cairo after reconciliation efforts took a downturn this weekend. Abbas's led Palestinian Authority has withdrawn its employees from controlling Gaza's passages, including the Rafah crossing with Egypt. The move has officially declared the failure of Cairo's brokered reconciliation agreement. The conflict with Hamas has frozen all reconciliation efforts. It has even delayed holding national general elections, which President Abbas was looking forward to. Palestinians are desperate to have a unified government taking care of all occupied territories. However, despite all the reconciliation efforts Cairo has led, nothing has changed between the Palestinian factions. Nonetheless, the Egyptian president confirmed that Cairo will continue seeking solutions to end the division among Palestinian factions. El Sisi has also confirmed that the Palestinian crisis will remain a top priority in Egypt's foreign policy. Abbas, however, appeared disappointed during this visit. He announced that he doesn't believe Palestinians will soon witness an end to the 70 years long crisis. <laughs> Peace appears to be far from being achieved. Everyone is waiting for what the American administration has dubbed as the deal of the century. But I don't think the Palestinians are expecting anything satisfactory to them. The world is still waiting for the details. I believe Abbas may be right. Peace will not happen soon. The Palestinian president holds the US, Israel and Hamas responsible for the failure of all efforts to resume peace talks. Abbas has prohibited all his officials from any communication with the United States. And after the recent escalations between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, Abbas's dependency on Cairo to communicate with these parties has become stronger. This week, Egypt will begin with the U.S. Secretary of State during his Middle East tour. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice.
And here's a quick recap now of the headlines at this hour. Gabon, where the chief military rebel who led a failed coup in Gabon on Monday has been arrested and two of his commandos killed after they stormed a public radio station. This is according to the country's presidency. The soldiers burst into state radio offices at dawn and called on the public to rise up against the rule of President Ali Bongo, who is recovering in Morocco after suffering a stroke. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, residents are tensely awaiting results of the presidential elections. The country's electoral commission says it will delay the publication of the results until it has consolidated all the votes it is receiving from polling stations. The commission says it had only received 50% of vote tally sheets by Sunday, which was the deadline. It is not yet clear when the results will be ready. In Somalia, a fact-finding committee is looking into allegations of civilian deaths and the violence witnessed during last month's regional elections. Local residents have welcomed the government's move. It comes days after Mogadishu expelled a top UN diplomat for raising the same issue. Orthodox Christians around the world have been celebrating Christmas this Monday. The spiritual leader of the Oriental Orthodox Church, Pope Tawadros II of Alexandria, led the Christmas Mass in Egypt. In a symbolic gesture of religious tolerance, Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, inaugurated a new cathedral for the Coptic Orthodox Church on Sunday and also one of the region's largest mosques. And that's a look at your headlines. Let's now turn our attention to matters business. Here's Ramanya Rama. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in business. The rand is showing signs of recovery against the US dollar. And Tunisia's tourism revenue was up by 45% in 2018. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. There is more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just a table mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Business in Africa is at the crossroads where opportunity meets innovation, where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor to the shout of a trader in a bustling free market, it's colorful, vibrant, and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the deal makers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Right, then let's start in the world of currency. South Africa's RAND posted gains against the American dollar in today's early trade, according to NKC Research. Now, today's performance follows a very strong run from the RAND last week. The RAND was about 0.02% weaker, a 13.95 to the greenback, after strengthening on a two-week basis uh, to a two-week best, rather, on Friday. But by 16.22 GMT, the RAND had consolidated gains to the dollar. It was at least six-tenths stronger, 13.8797 being the relevant number at that time. Emerging market currencies have been boosted by increased expectations of a rate cut or two in the United States. 
Over in North Africa, Tunisia's tourism revenue increased to about $1.36 billion last year, growing by at least 45% year on year. Now, at 8.3 million visitors in 2018, the North African state saw record arrival numbers in the sector, which accounts for roughly 8% of the country's GDP. Now, with the return of tourists from Europe to the country, the sector is also expected to post a strong performance in 2019 while lending support to the country's currency as well. Authorities expect about 9 million or so of tourists to visit the country in 2019. On to Uganda now. Civil society budget advocacy groups have expressed a lot of concern about the country's growing levels of public debt. By the end of June 2018, Uganda's total public debt was over $11 billion. That's about 41.5% of its GDP. The country's Auditor General also points out that the country's debt levels rose by at least 22% between the end of June 2017 and end June last year. The civil society group said that 34% of Uganda's 2019-2020 budget will be spent just on debt service. And at those levels, the country's debt is rapidly becoming unsustainable. Well, still in Uganda, it has managed to increase its exports over the last year by over 350 million dollars. Data from the Bank of Uganda shows that the value of exports rose from about $3.2 billion in the 2016-2017 fiscal year to just over $3.5 billion in the following fiscal year. That growth is partly driven by the increasing reliance on Uganda for food supplies by her neighbours in East Africa. Here's CGTN's Michael Beleke with this report. Thomas Siga prepares a consignment for export. Fresh foods, fruits and vegetables now comprised of Uganda's biggest export products in terms of volumes. What gives us an um, advantage is that our products are best or are good compared to what other countries produce. Iga exports much of his fruits and vegetables to the European Union, Canada, the UK and recently the Middle East. We have the demands that we can satisfy. For example, in Dubai, they need a lot of avocados. Uh, we take Oman, generally, we have Oman, uh, Bahrain, and uh, some other countries in the Middle East. So it's, it's a growing market, and the exports generally are growing. Other key export products, according to figures from Bank of Uganda, include coffee, tea, sorghum, soap, vegetable oil, and fish. Despite the challenges of insecurity in South Sudan, the DR Congo and Burundi, Uganda is registering a significant increase in regional trade largely with the East African community partner states. Uganda is selling much of its corn and beans to its neighbors. The growth, according to trade experts, signifies the importance of regional integration. The EEAC and COMESA, the regional market, has become strong for us. Two, that not only is it taking food and primary products, but we're exporting manufactured products. Trade experts say the export of value-added products is creating more jobs for locals, but also earning the country more money. Uganda is also looking to tap into new markets, such as China, to promote non-food products like tourism. Over the last uh, 30 years and more, China has gotten more than, more than 400 million people out of poverty. So the incomes have risen. And when incomes rise, this is an opportunity to also begin to travel to go and relax and chill, and Uganda is one of the countries you want to come and chill in. However, as exports grow, Uganda's import bill remains significantly high, largely for the import of raw materials, but also cheap alternatives to locally manufactured products. But for exporters like Thomas Iga, keeping the quality of their products is key in penetrating and maintaining their export markets. Michael Balekesigitian, Kampala, Uganda. Right then, delegates from China and the United States have been holding fresh talks in Beijing that are aimed at ending the trade war between the world's top two economies. Now, the two-day meeting is scheduled to end on the 8th of January. This is the first formal meeting since they agreed to refrain from any further tariffs or actions against each other, really, for at least 90 days last November. Now, today's talks come amid rising concern about the impact of this trade war on the global economy as a whole. The U.S. delegation is led by the Deputy U.S. Trade Representative Jeffrey Garish. That 90-day truce, remember, between China and the United States, that runs out in another two months. Now, as talks between the two sides resume, it's worth asking what has been accomplished in efforts to resolve this long-running trade war. CGTN's Jiang Xiaoyi has some answers.
Beijing and Washington have kept in close communication since the two leaders agreed to a 90-day trade truce on December the 1st. Just days after the meeting between Presidents Xi and Trump, Chinese Vice Premier Liu He, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer discussed by phone on how to implement the truce. Three days later, China announced a three-month suspension of tariff hikes on U.S. cars and auto parts. The same day, the U.S. officially pushed back the scheduled date of a tariff rate increase on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods to March the 2nd. Five days later, two sides conducted a phone conversation at the vice ministerial level. They exchanged views on issues such as the trade balance and strengthening intellectual property protection and made new progress. On December the 29th, the two leaders were on the phone again. They both expressed the desire for stable progress in ties. President Xi said he hoped they could reach an agreement beneficial to both as soon as possible. And President Trump tweeted that big progress was being made toward the deal. And a U.S. delegation led by Deputy Trade Representative Jeffrey Gerrish is in Beijing for two days of face-to-face -face talks, which both sides hope will be positive and constructive. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. All right, I'm going to leave it there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. At that time, we'll be focusing on South Africa's power supplier, ESCOM. It's scaling up the range of job cuts as part of a much broader restructuring program. But where exactly do tariff hikes come into the picture? We'll have some answers for you at 1800 GMT on Global Business. See you then. For now, though, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here in the program. Here's what's ahead. Skin lightening products are no longer accessible in Rwanda following a government ban. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Rwanda has banned cosmetics used to lighten the skin. The government says chemicals in the products are harmful to the health of their users. Beauty may only be skin deep, but millions of people in Africa are putting their lives at risk to attain an interpretation of it through skin lightening. Often using products containing powerful and prohibited toxins like hydroquinone and mercury. I am very sad that these products have been banned. We will just use what is locally available. But the people who made that decision need to know that these products make a woman feel beautiful. Even with the clear dangers, many users say they should be allowed to choose for themselves. If I don't have these products, I'm afraid I will become too dark, like I used to be. I still have a few products left, but I hate the thought of becoming darker. Rwandan President Paul Kagame catalyzed the crackdown when he weighed in on a recent discussion on social media about the growing use of skin lighteners. We are now putting much efforts, like uh, educating people, going around and seizing those illegal products. So you can say that we are also joining those other countries that are also in this fight of the, the use of uh, those skin retaining uh, cosmetics. African countries like Ghana, Kenya and South Africa also have prohibitive laws, but like Rwanda, they struggle to come between willing buyers and smugglers in the billion-dollar industry. I'm happy to hear that those cosmetics have been banned because so many people are using these skin lightening products. Sometimes they have such a drastic effect on the skin. You can meet someone you know and not even recognize them. It is a good development. The World Health Organization estimates that at least four in every ten African women bleach their skin. Beryl Oro, CGTN.
And in Sweden, Dr. Samuel West, a 44-year-old psychologist, is using a collection of flopped products and service innovations from around the world to inspire innovation and teach others important lessons from failures. Take a look. Founded by organizational psychologist Dr. Samuel West, the Museum of Failure exhibits some of the most epic corporate product fails. His fascination with the psychology of failure led him to come up with the idea. At a glance, it appears to host the most depressing collection ever. However, according to West, this is a way to stimulate innovations through learning from other people's failures. I was looking for a new way to communicate research findings and stimulate a discussion and interest in the whole concept of, of learning from failure. And I, I thought an exhibit would be a fun way to do that. Another reason I started the museum was I got so fed up with these stories of success that everywhere in the newspapers, magazines, we're always force fed these, these sort of ideas. From unsuccessful vehicles to failed beauty products and soft drinks, the exhibition features examples of the most spectacular business fails. Here, some of the most unlikely innovations have once again found fame. One of the items that has gotten a lot of attention is an electric facial mask. Um, it, you, it's called a rejuvenique. It's a fake French word from an American company. and you, it, it has electrodes on it and you put it on your face. Uh, and it shocks your face to make you beautiful, like me. Many people are applauding him for this. In a way, they feel that the pressure from society to always be successful is lifted off their shoulders, seeing that big brands went through a similar path. Visitors are treated to a learning experience about the important role of failure in innovation. Some of the more interesting responses from visitors at the museum are that they feel like it's liberating. They see like Coca-Cola, uh, Apple, you know, these big, big companies, Google, um, that they fail when they try something new, when they try to develop a new product or a service. And it kind of liberates us as sort of individuals. The message is clear. Keep on trying beyond failed attempts. I have a little bit of a bias because I like to talk about how in childhood we're not allowing our children in the USA to experience risk and if they don't experience risk they'll never experience failure. You can do the uh, same idea in workplaces where uh, if you experience a failure it means that you're innovating, that you're trying. So failure is not necessarily a dirty word. The Museum of Failure is quickly gaining popularity due to its different yet unique approach towards innovation. Many now refer to West's work as uplifting. It has turned out to be an unexpected success for West with visiting exhibitions in Los Angeles and Toronto. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. And your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead.